Hello dear, Rose here, writer, director, etc. of this podcast audio drama, welcoming you to the third season of the Wessex dramas The Laodicean. This novel was the last of Thomas Hardy's Novels of Ingenuity trilogy. The story is a gentle romantic comedy set in a rather indecisive heiress's castle. I must warn you, Victorian intrigue, cross purposes and architecture feature rather heavily in this tale. So throw on a tea gown, put your toes in the fender and tell the butler you are not at home and let's dive into the drama. Paula is looking in a shop window when Distancy comes up to join them. He bows, turns and offers his two arms for them to take. The group of three then walk off up the hill. Charlotte and Distancy come into the museum where Paula is bending over and inspecting the contents of a display case with her uncle. Charlotte addresses Mr Power and Distancy takes Paula's arm and walks her away. Paula is sitting in a cafe with Mrs Goodman and Distancy. Her aunt goes to make a purchase and Paula puts down the water glass from which she has been sipping. Distancy picks it up, pours some more water into it and purposely drinks from it at the exact place from where she had drunk. Paula rolls her eyes. Distancy and Paula are walking along talking. Distancy is paying her compliments, but Paula's not really accepting them. She nods, coolly, and looks away at the flowers. Distancy asks her a question, and she answers it gravely, nodding her head, slowly. She then smiles, gently puts up her parasol, and turns away up another smaller path by herself. Distancy is walking along the pavement when he spies his son drinking some wine at a small table. Distancy looks at Dare in surprise and sits down next to him. I thought you were going home. Oh, just made a pile on the blackjack tables and so have booked in at your hotel for a few days. He pokes at a bag on the floor near to him with his cane and it chinks. He smiles and waggles his eyebrows. Shall I lend you five pounds? For goodness sake, stop this gambling, Will. You have no income and I am poverty-stricken. Dare smiles and elbows him in the ribs. But not for long. He gets up, leaves some money on the table and strolls off with Distancy joining him. She telegraphed him to come and join us, you know. It was you, wasn't it? Moi? Oh, go on then, I'll come clean, gov. Twas I. He histrionically puts his hand on his chest. Distancy groans. Good grief, boy. You'll be the death of me. Dare puts his arm in his father's and raises his eyebrows in faux injured pride. Well, if you're going to take it like that, although all is fair in love and war, I shan't tell you of my next shape on Somerset. Distancy stands and faces Dare. I don't want to hear it, Will. Just stop working on my behalf, will you? It does no good and it's... Dishonourable. They pass Paula and Charlotte, who are on the other side of the road. The women smile and wave as they go into a draper's. Now you've been seen. I know and I'm not wanted. (laughs) I shall go drown my sorrows in a decent bottle of champagne and a steam bath. He digs his father in the ribs again. See you later, Peter. He strolls away, carrying his bag and twirling his walking cane. Charlotte is sitting, sewing near the fireplace. Sitting opposite to her, Mr Power is reading the newspaper. Paula is sitting further away, near the window, next to a work table. She is drumming her fingers on the work table in an irritated manner. Distancy enters, smiles at the party and heads towards an armchair which has an opened book lying on it. Oh, Captain. I've just sent for Mr Dare, whom we saw with you. Oh, um... My uncle found out that he's staying at this very hotel. We thought that perhaps he could shed some light on Mr Somerset's actions. Distancy sits down. The door opens and Jenkins announces an arrival. Mr Dare, madam? Dare comes into the middle of the room. Jenkins goes out. Mr Dare, we're anxious to know something on Miss Power's architect, whom we believe you have seen lately. 
Yes, sir. Where did you see him? Just for half an hour at the casino at Monte Carlo. Distanti gets up and leaves the room. What date was that, please? Um, it uh, was April the... He pats his pockets and withdraws a silk handkerchief and a small diary. A photograph tumbles out of the handkerchief to the floor. Charlotte, looking at it, suddenly exclaims. <sighs> Paula, interested in the cause of Charlotte's outcry, bends down, picks up and looks at the photo. It is a photo of Somerset, grimacing, and appearing to be in an advanced state of inebriation. Paula looks shocked and then resentful and tosses the photograph lightly onto the work table. Mr Power comes over to the table, looks at the photograph and hands it back to the young man with a queer smile on his face. I'm so sorry. I thought I had destroyed it. He seemed to be most terribly drunk. Oh dear. Paula goes over to look out of the window. It's a pity a professional man should make himself so ludicrous. I should scarcely have expected that from him. Paula walks back to her chair by the work table and picks up some sewing. Ha! Huh. You don't know the half of it, Uncle. She looks up at Dare. Thank you, Mr Dare. We're so sorry to have troubled you. Dare gives a small nod of his head. Not at all, madam. It's my pleasure. He nods again and walks out. The silence in the room is deafening and the mantel clock sounds very loud. Distancy and Dare are sitting at a small table which looks out onto the main reception hall. They are drinking wine. Dare sees Somerset arrive with his bag and go to inquire at reception. Uh oh Distancy looks up and sees Somerset. His face falls. He puts his wine back on the table. Dare stands up quickly. Well, uh, I'll um, be off now, Captain. Back to England, as you advised. They both see Somerset walking up the stairs. Will, I am greatly disappointed in you. You have done a foolish thing and now must suffer the consequences. Dare shrugs. Piffle. He may have gone up to them, but he's going to come down jolly quickly with a flea in his ear. See you back at Markton, Peter. He smiles and leaves in haste. Jenkins opens the door. Mr Somerset, madam. Somerset comes forward towards the work table. Hello, Mr Somerset. Good morning. Mr Somerset bows slightly to Charlotte, Paula and Abe. Paula smiles brightly and ironically. There must be something terribly urgent about the building works to have dragged you across Europe, Mr Somerset. Well, I did have to stay a day or so each at Genoa, San Remo and Benton. I don't require your itinerary. Somerset gets his drawings out of his small briefcase and spreads them on the table before her. He then brokenly whispers, Do you speak seriously? Paula pushes the sketches away from her, gets up, and looking glassily at the tip of one of Somerset's ears, answers, Hmm, they'll do. If you have a pen, I can sign off the permission, Chitty. Somerset gives her a pen from his pocket. Paula hastily signs the chit and walks away to stand by the window. Thank you, Miss Power. He looks agonisedly in puzzlement at her back. Somerset then rapidly scoops the sketches and Chitty into his briefcase and turns to go. Mr Power suddenly speaks from over the top of his newspaper. Well now, thanks for those details, Mr Somerset. It'll be good to see the changes when we get back. Thank you. Thank you. Somerset bows and leaves in confusion. The members of the party resume their activities in the quiet room. A minute later, Mrs Goodman bustles in. She proceeds to remove her bonnet and jacket while talking to Paula. I just passed that nice Mr Somerset. Why haven't you asked him for dinner, dear? I don't want him here. Well, that's a bit strange, Paula. It was only a week or so ago that you said that you would not object to marrying him. It's a mistake. I meant the other one. What? Captain Distancy? Yes. Mrs Goodman rears her head back and makes astounded eyes. <laughs> Paula looks around and is perturbed to find that Distancy is standing in the middle of the room and had heard her avowal. She looks away and quickly walks to the window at the far end of the large drawing room. Distancy hastily follows her. I am eternally grateful to you for avowing that I have one favour at last. Paula is somewhat reserved. I didn't know you were there. Yes, but can I take you at your word? I suppose so. 
As a lover on probation, no more. Would it be presumptuous to expect more? Within a few weeks? Paula looks away to some flowers on a table. It would indeed. Somerset sits in his train seat, looking despondently out of the window. The servants are just finishing loading the carriages, and Mr Power is helping the ladies into their carriage as well. Somerset is lugging his bags along a platform in a depressed manner. Paula's party is sitting in a waiting room with four gaily dressed fan de siècle hatted people. There is a sign on the wall saying Ne Haché. Big steamships can be heard hooting outside. Distancy fusses, helping Paula with her cape and small bag. Somerset is sadly packing some of his papers from his castle office into a box. Paula's party are sitting in another waiting room with four other people dressed in sombre black. The sign now says no spitting and the sound of steam trains puffing and hooting is to be heard. Distancy attempts to help Paula with her bag, but is rebuffed irritably. Somerset is coughing and wearing his pyjamas and dressing gown as he comes into the room carrying a cup of tea. He looks very miserable and puts his tea on his bedside table. He takes out and wraps a scarf around his head before disrobing and climbing into bed. He blows his nose on a big hanky and sips the remains of his tea while still coughing on and off. He sighs and looks across the room through the window. The foreman is sitting at Somerset's desk, writing, when Paula comes in. The foreman shoots to his feet and tips his invisible cap. Morning, ma'am. Good morning. Where is Mr Somerset, please? Oh, the work be nearly finished, ma'am. So we just be a coming in so as to check I'm seeing to limners. Oh, and them blighted leggy tritions. Is he still lodging in Markton? No, ma'am. Just outside at Rose Cottage, on the low road to Reakham, Pamp at the church. He's been a great deal targeting these last couple of days. Paula nods, preoccupiedly, and chews her lip. Yes. Well... Thank you. She goes out. Mrs Goodman is sitting sewing in a bower. Paula strolls in absently and sits down, nearish to her. Mr Somerset has moved out now. Mm. Paula shrugs airily. Well, what is that to me? Mrs Goodman puts down her sewing and turns to face Paula. I'm afraid that I must tell you, my dear, that you were totally wrong about Mr Somerset. Wrong? Yes, your uncle confided to me yesterday that he suspects that Mr Dare falsified that photograph with his new photographic methods. Your uncle has seen others of that type before. Paula shoots to her feet. Yes, and because of this, I telegraphed the Monaco Casino and apparently the telegraph which was sent begging for money came from a short blonde youth in his late teen years, not a tall man with brown hair. I fear it was sent by that Mr Dare, Paula. Not Mr. Sum... Oh! Excuse me, Aunt. Paula tears off. Somerset is lying on the sofa in his dressing gown, with his scarf around his head and tied under his chin, <coughs> when Paula comes quietly in. He whips off the scarf and attempts to sit up while she closes the door behind her. Paula pushes him back down and sits down on the floor next to him. 
She takes his hand. Somerset looks amazed. No, rest. You're poorly, and I have come to apologise. Somerset sniffs and looks even more amazed. Falsehoods were practised on me, which made me think badly of you, George. And I have come to apologise for what must have seemed unwanted cruelty. Falsehoods? Yes. Too complicated to explain just now. But I have come here to see if you are still connemure with me. Paula, I have lain here for the last couple of days and thought, if you will forgive me, of the great disparity between us, a poor man and a rich lady. I couldn't, couldn't take advantage of you. Paula stands up. The only advantage is to me, with such a gallant knight as you. I will not give you this choice again, George. If you want to marry me as you once did, I am here to be asked. Somerset slowly smiles, throws off his covers, gets up and comes towards her. He takes hold of her shoulders gently and leans towards her to kiss her, but she escapes from his grasp and runs around the sofa. Ah! Bugs! Bugs! I am not having a streaming nose and red piggy eyes on my honeymoon. Somerset smiles delightedly and heads off around the sofa again. Paula and George come out of the church dressed in bridal clothes. They are wreathed in smiles. There are about 30 people milling around the church path to the lich gate. These people, along with Mrs Goodman and Charlotte, throw rice at the pair. The church bells are ringing. Distancy and Uncle Abe watch as Paula and George get into the carriage. They drive away as Mrs Goodman and Charlotte sniff, dab their noses and wave with their handkerchiefs. Paula is seated in charming, lacy déshabillé, finishing her breakfast tea at the tea table near the window. Somerset is in trousers and shirt, sitting on the bed, pulling on a sock. Paula opens a letter and starts reading. I'll just read this from Auntie, before we set off up Penna Van, darling. Of course, my love. Hmm. 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 Oh! Auntie has moved back in with Uncle, into their old family home. Good grief! Charlotte has gone to be a nun. One of those new type of Anglian nuns. Gosh, that was terribly sudden. Somerset starts putting his shoes on. Hmm, it is. How strange. Paula suddenly shoots to her feet. Good grief! And a lot of the castle has burnt down. Somerset shoots to his feet. The castle? All my work! Paula comes around and sits next to him on the bed. She smiles and kisses him. Oh, don't worry, darling. The castle was insured, so we can rebuild it. Somerset turns to her. Yes, I suppose so. It does rather depend, however, on how much of it is left. Paula and Somerset, holding hands, walk up the knoll to the top and where they can see the castle. I just wanted to come here to look at the poor old castle from the top, to see the full extent of the damage. I'm just glad that none of the servants, nor your workers, were hurt. I'm afraid it looks like there's going to be considerable new building needed, though, doesn't it? Somerset pulls her to his side and lays his head on the top of hers. Never mind, my dear. In marrying this particular architect, you got someone who can marry the old with the new. She looks up at him. And hopefully can make a harmonious whole out of the two. Paula reaches up and throws her arms around his neck. She kisses him. And you've married someone new who used to own some old. Oh, George, you're better than an old castle any day, though. was an episode of the Laodicean, 
I would like to thank the amazing cast for this episode. Caro, Joy, Catherine Dyer, Neil Hiley, John Simpson, Tony Lee, Scott Monroe, James Heseltine, John T. O'Callaghan, Jenny Dyer, Stephanie Stefan, John Seal, Peter Allison, Robin Lee, and Tracy Hayes. I would also like to thank our brilliant, patient, and multi-talented editor, David Harris, for all of his hard work and patience on this. The music is from Epidemic Sound and is The English Affair by Howard Harper Barnes. Anyways, see you next time, gentlefolk. Thank you.